Well, hello everybody. It's College Math here coming at you from outdoors. And today we're going to talk about shared vision and we're going to mash it up with Robert Rosen's anticipatory systems. It's going to be super interesting. I'm going to start, oh, by the way, shared vision to you is known as your common why. I know you've been working on that common why, right, in your team companies. Um, in the world of strategic planning, creating that common why is called creating your shared vision. So with that, we're going to start with a beautiful video by Peter Senge, and I'm going to be showing you his take on the creation of shared vision and pausing it at various intervals, and um, then I'll bring this in and I'll kind of show you how this anticipatory systems theory plays into the creation of shared vision. So let's start by hearing from the wonderful one and only Peter Senge. As you really work on bringing people together around things they really care about, you're going to start to encounter some of the core dynamics of building shared visions. This term, uh, shared vision, is often really misunderstood. In, in fact, what often happens in organizations all the time, maybe you've lived through this, someone up here says, hey, let me tell you about what our vision is. And just because they say it, it becomes the shared vision, which of course isn't true at all. It's one person's vision using their position of authority to act as if it's a shared vision. Uh, but in fact, shared visions are real. And you've probably all heard that phrase, there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. It's a beautiful articulation of the power of real shared visions. So in any innovation process, this is part of the territory you're working on. And we found over the years there's a couple of basics that if people can start to get it, it really helps them a lot. The first is... There is always this interplay between the personal vision and the shared vision. To put it bluntly, if there are no personal visions, forget shared vision. Really shared vision, not a facade, but the reality of shared vision. Because what brings people to work each day, what inspires them, is their own vision. Uh, personal. All right, that sounded pretty important. So it looks like before we can really understand shared vision, we have to understand personal vision. And that's where I'd like to start in with the theory of anticipatory systems. And I'll show you what personal vision means in that context. Okay, this is a wonderful theory. Um, I've, I've read most of this book and it's absolutely awesome, but it's not understandable to most people. So I'll try to break it down to you. And more importantly, just give you the good parts that hopefully will aid your work in the change maker lab. Okay, an anticipatory system has three basic components. The first component is the natural world. And that's the world that I'm sitting in right here and the natural world with the grass and the chickens walking by and everything is just going the way that it usually goes. Fine. The second component is what Rosen calls the model or the formal system, which is our brain's attempt at observing and trying to distill down and understand the natural system. I'm going to mark that over here as M. This is the model of the system. And this is really where personal vision comes in. Because personal vision, your personal vision, is the core of this model right here. Okay? Why do you care so much about that? Well, I'll tell you. The third component of Rosen's theory is that there's this connection between the natural world and our model of the world. And that connection, the third component, has two parts. There's a decoding process. I'm going to mark that as delta to uh, match a paper I'm going to present to you later. Um, this decoding process here is how we steer reality using our personal vision as the directional steering. Okay? That is why it's actually such an important part of your learning compass. Because what does a compass do? It tells us what direction we're going. What does your personal vision do? It steers you. It points in the direction of where you're going. So it's very critically important for you to have a personal vision. That's going to be part of your learning compass. That's the part that asks where do you want to go. Once you have that laid out, your brain and its modeling of the world is going to use the decoding process delta to steer the present in the actual world towards the direction of your personal vision. So that's why it's critically, critically important. Okay, so delta here is the decoding process. I'll just write that down.
And this is, again, how we affect the natural world. Okay? The other piece of that third component, I told you this is the connecting component between the natural world and the model, is what I'm going to mark as epsilon to match the paper I'll show you in a minute. Epsilon is the encoding. And you can see that the encoding goes from the natural, natural world into your model. So this is basically the way that we see the world. This is our perception. And we all have different perceptions. We all see different focuses and think about different things with different levels of importance. And so we each have a different way of encoding the natural world and of decoding um, which steers us in the direction of our personal vision. Okay, this is really important stuff to understand and um, introducing this so that hopefully we can start to have a shared language that we can use in the Change Maker Lab to understand our work better and aid that work. So basically I've introduced four key words to you right now that hopefully you understand even at the basics level, which is N, the natural system, M, your model of that system, and then decoding from M into N, and encoding from N into M. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, here's another piece from anticipatory systems. Is it, Why is it called anticipatory? The word anticipate means that we're kind of predicting, right? We think something's gonna happen. If I throw some grass over here at the chickens, they're gonna know, oh, hey, you want to get something? And they're going to come over and they're going to come and get it. Or maybe they won't because I'm on video now, so they don't want to play. Anyhow, so what I want to tell you is that in this model, your brain is running. It's running your model of the world faster than real time, which is like how fast the natural world is running. It basically means you're thinking, oh, this is going to happen. And then you have a future prediction inside of your head. So inside here is another of Senge's disciplines called mental models. The discipline of mental models is super important inside of this modeling process. Um, in fact, this modeling process kind of feeds back into itself. And so I'm going to put an arrow that's coming from and going back into this mental model. An example of that I covered in a previous workshop on iteration, and so I'd like to show you where you can find that. Um, back in the fall here, I was talking about iterative processes, and I pulled an example from the fifth discipline uh, field book, an example that Rick Ross introduced called the Ladder of Inference. And um, I encourage you to watch the video. I'll put the link inside the description of this video. And you can see that in this picture of the ladder of inference, at the bottom of the ladder, we have some observables. That's the data. That's what we choose to take in from the natural world. And then we encode it by perceiving it. And we come into our model. And then we climb this ladder. So this loop that you see climbing the ladder goes from observables to selecting data then adding meanings to those data through the idea of our own mental models, making assumptions based on our beliefs, drawing conclusions, adopting those beliefs about the world, and then taking actions based on our conclusions. Okay, so um, how Robert Rosen would describe this in his theory of anticipatory systems is he would say that the model is running faster than real time. So it's giving us information about the future which we then use the decoding process to influence the present state. And that's the concept of steering, okay? Once again, it's critically important for you to have a personal vision because the personal vision is the core of your model. It is, in fact, what's steering your model. If you have a personal vision, then you will feel steered in the direction of that vision. Now think about how you feel right now. Do you feel steered in a direction? Or do you maybe feel a little bit lost? Like brownie in motion, you're just kind of chilling, kind of not really going anywhere in any particular direction? If you feel that way, then you're experiencing the contrapositive um, or a logically equivalent statement to what I just said. If you have a model, 
then you will feel direction. A logical equivalent to that is, if you feel no direction, then you have no personal vision. And that's a problem. So before we go into shared vision, before you go back into your team company to talk about your common why, you really need to decide on, think deeply about what is your personal vision. All right, now let's see what else Sengay has to say. Visions are sort of like the soil nutrients out of which you grow something called a shared vision. So you really are always in this territory of engaging people, talking about what they care about, and then looking for ways that this can be aligned and assembled and put together so there's something we're actually collectively caring about. The, the one other thing we found very helpful that people, once they start to understand, is that diversity is actually part of shared vision. If you go and ask everybody what's the vision, everybody uses the exact same words, I will tell you something, that is not a shared vision. People have memorized the correct words to talk about the vision. They've re they're reciting the catechism, so to speak. They're not actually expressing something they're committed to. All right, that's super important. So now let's talk about what it means to dialogue on your shared vision and um, understand the coupling between multiple anticipatory systems. Because really, if each of us is an anticipatory system carrying around our own mental model of the natural world, when we're in team company together and we're talking and listening to each other, that would be a coupling of a multiple, uh, multiple of these systems. So now I'm going to draw a coupling of multiple anticipatory systems. And like Senge said, this is kind of like the soil out of which your shared vision will grow. I really like that analogy. I love gardening. So I'm going to draw kind of a soil here. And then I'm going to draw a bunch of anticipatory systems, which are all the heads in the room. So here's me and my friend and another person and another person. A diverse set of heads all decoding and encoding reality because we're all anticipatory systems. But the thing is, when we're in team company together and we're having a dialogue together, we are all coupled. We are all coupled through the dialogue. Hopefully everyone in the room has brought their personal vision and now you understand how critically important that is. Another thing that Senge said is that we need diversity. We can't just have everybody saying the same exact thing because that's way too rigid and that's not true. We don't all have the same personal vision. That's okay. It's actually critically important that we don't all have the same vision. We are a diverse set of individuals with a diverse set of personal visions. And we are going to speak our minds through straightforward speaking. That's one of the tenets of dialogue. Okay, so how are we um, delta? How are we decoding into the dialogue with all of our little deltas here? We're using straightforward talk. And you need to be true about it, okay? Don't say what you think I want to hear. I, I want to hear you say what you really mean, okay? So, delta, the decoding process. We're talking about straight forward talk. Okay. Another tenet of dialogue is active listening. And that's the encoding process. We're all coupled together in the same room having a dialogue. And we're all listening to each other. And so there's all of our epsilon. We're taking in all that stuff. Epsilon here, here, here. And the encoding process that we're experiencing through is active listening. Luckily we had a workshop on that early on. But keep to it. Keep true to it. You need to do active listening at all times in your team company. Now we're also on Zoom, right? So I've said this before in the room, but boy, I sure do appreciate it when people have their videos on in Zoom. And the thing about videos is that is a visual encoding. So we have active listening with our ears for an auditory encoding, but if we all have our cameras on, we can also see each other. 
So just like sitting in a real circle, which is the intention, the original intention of dialogue, we're, you know, nodding or shaking our head or kind of confused or we're sending signals that are visual cues that we can use to encode what's going on in that dialogue. And so please, please, if you can, as much as you can, stand it. Please turn your cameras on. Cameras on. So that we can all see each other and use that input as part of our encoding process. Okay. Oh, while we're on the topic of Zoom, I'd like to mention one more thing that possibly could um, restrict our dialogue, and that is the chat function. Um, I know, I know, a lot of people like the chat function. We've talked about this before, but the thing is, when we're trying to do this dialogue, and it is through this dialogue that we get emergence. Emergence. Writing with a Sharpie here, better not have any typos. Um, the dialogue creates emergence, right? We're all decoding one at a time. We're being very respectful. Another tenant of dialogue is to respect each other by giving each other the space for each person to speak one at a time, respect them, actively listen to them, and wait until they finish. Now, if you have side chats going on, if the chat function is open and people are typing little things and sharing that way too, that kind of breaks this process. And if you break this process, it's going to be more difficult for emergence to take place. Okay, okay, you don't have to just believe me. I'm going to start to back this up with this actual paper on anticipatory systems. The link to this will also be in the chat um, because I know you're going to want to read this and it's a really great paper. But uh, let me just show you what I was talking about. So there's Robert Rosen. Awesome sauce. Good job. Um, here's his model of an anticipatory system. So this is kind of what we were talking about with the natural system N. And then the formal system marked F is the same thing as the model. We have the decoding and encoding processes. And then we have feedback loops inside of each of the things. The natural system is running in its normal, causal, deterministic, laws of physics type of thing. And the formal system or model is feeding back on itself through what he calls inferential entailment, but what I just referred to as the ladder of inference. Okay? So let you read through this on your own time, but I wanted to hone in on this part on errors. And you can see here that sometimes not only do we have an effector that's affecting the system, but we kind of have a side thing going on. And that side thing is really not good for dialogue. I'll just be honest about it. And the reason why is kind of written right here. It says side effects arise because essentially structures have multiple functions and functions can be carried out by multiple structures. Here I was just speaking about Zoom and the fact that we have the auditory taking turns dialogue and then we have this side structure, the chat, where anybody can just pop in at any time. Okay, well, combined with the fact that our models are incomplete, something I won't go into detail on right now, it's part of his theory, the consequence is that, in general, an effector will have additional effects on S to those plans. What I'm planning here, what we're planning, what we're trying to do inside of our dialogue is we're planning to emerge a common why, a shared vision together. That's what we're trying to do. Okay? But the plan modes of interaction will be modified by those extraneous effects. And that's the part that I'm talking about. When you have the chat feature open, you're kind of creating this little side swipe here that's not really part of the planned process. It's not one of the tenets of dialogue that you can just type stuff and over the person who's speaking, and it kind of messes with the emergence. Um, don't shoot the messenger. I'm trying to explain it using mathematical theory. And hopefully it'll really help us get going on creating our shared vision together through dialogue. We're a coupled system. We're um, a coupled group of anticipatory systems. Okay, let's go back to Senge's video while we're here. Let's see what else he's got to say here. But by contrast, there is a hole. 
that can start to emerge in a shared vision. And the simplest way to understand that whole we found over the years is just to ponder, how does a hologram work? We've all seen the hologram, these three-dimensional images, which are quite remarkable. You kind of walk around the side and look at it, and you actually see it from a different angle and walk around here. It really does appear to be three-dimensional. And in fact, though, the physics of it, it's being projected on a plate, on a two-dimensional surface. Um, and the interesting thing about a hologram that really is instructive in understanding shared vision is if you take that surface and you cut it in half, and you look at that half, you see the whole image, whatever that hologram is showing. You cut it in half again, so you've now got a quarter of that plate. You see the whole image. It's completely different than a photograph that way. If you cut a photograph in half, you see half the photograph. If you cut it in quarter, you see a quarter of the photograph. But a hologram, you don't. You see the whole of it. But you actually see it from a slightly different point of view. It'll still seem three-dimensional, but it's actually more limited. It's from a particular point of view. It's a little bit like if you pull a screen down over a window. You poke a hole in the screen. You see everything on the other side of that screen, but you see it from that point of view. If you look at a hole over here, you see it from another point of view. So shared visions are a little bit paradoxical in this sense. It really is about a whole, different people kind of holding a whole. That whole is the shared vision. But it's also about them seeing it from their unique point of view. It's not about uh, re repressing or covering up the fact that I see it this way and you see it this way and you see it this way. Very interesting. What Singhi's talking about there is the concept of emergence. The shared vision is going to emerge out of the dialogue process that we're having together. As long as we stick to that process truly and faithfully, it will emerge. I talked about emergence before in a previous workshop. There's the workshop right there. It's uh, on self-organization and emergence part two. And I have noticed that part one of this self-organization and emergence workshop has about twice as many views as part two. So if you're not seeing part two, you're missing out. In particular, um, around the 55 minute mark, I introduce this analogy of what's called a reaction diffusion system, which is a network of coupled pieces coupled through um, local diffusion. And as these parts interact, a pattern starts to emerge. And that pattern is greater than any of the individual behaviors that are possible. I actually have it right here. It's pretty cool to watch it happen. So I'll let it start from scratch there and look at that. Wow, that beautiful pattern emerges. Now, what does this have to do with what Senge's talking about in the holograms? I'd like to show you, this is really cool. I thought that was so cool when he said um, a hologram can be broken into pieces and inside each of those pieces, you can still see the whole thing. The same is true about a reaction diffusion simulation. Um, you can see here that I just took a screenshot of the mazes pattern that I had from my video and consider what would happen if I kind of just grabbed a little piece of this, right? Oh, sorry. Um, I grab a little piece of this up, I select a little piece of this, copy it, and paste it below, and let's consider that's me understanding our shared vision together. So up here, what I'm saying is up here, this big block, this pattern that emerged, which is greater than any of the individuals, that large block is the analogy of our shared vision together. Just like he said with the holograms, if I start to capture little pieces of that, it doesn't even matter where I capture them from. I just randomly grab them up. They're all going to look in a way similar, but different. Isn't, isn't that strange? Just like he was saying about the holograms, they're all going to basically contain the idea of the whole thing, but they're going to be kind of seeing it from a different perspective. So this is a a new analogy that we can use for the shared vision and how we all have the shared vision together combined in our own visions. Oh, here, let me scroll down a little bit on this. It might be a little hard for you to see this here. But you can see that kind of like the picture that I drew over here. Up top is our common coupling, our dialogue that creates our shared vision, and that's the pattern. And then no matter where we capture little pieces from, those pieces are the individual's understanding of that shared vision. Each of those pieces 
has the whole in it in some way. They still capture the essence of that pattern, and yet they're unique at the same time. So they're similar but unique at the same time. That's exactly what we want to do with our shared vision, okay? So to summarize, here we have all of our personal visions. Remember, you need to have a personal vision or we're not going to be able to do this correctly. So you have your personal vision, I have my personal vision, they have their personal vision, everybody's got their personal visions, they're all different. You dialogue on that in the coupled space and that's how emergence takes place. And from that emergence grows a beautiful shared vision. I want you to think about this as a birthing process. You all are together in a dialogue. You all are decoding your personal vision together and encoding, listening to each other's personal visions. And then together, you're going to decide on some shared vision. This vision is not a compromise. This isn't trying to find a statement, some blanket statement that sort of describes what each of you does and you're kind of okay with the way that that's said. No, nothing like that. This is a birth giving. <laughs> We're trying to create something new together, just like you saw in the reaction diffusion model. As those parts interacted, they created organically a pattern together. You will give birth to a shared vision. To help you out, and this has helped me out quite a bit to understand the form of the shared vision, it might help for you to think about this as, um, the form of your shared vision can be thought of as an effect on a sector. Okay, so I'm just going to write that down as a suggested form. If you have some effect on a sector. Okay, so you all are going to think about what drives you as individuals. What's your personal vision? You all are going to share that and listen to each other. Practice dialogue. Then together something beautiful will be born. And you may consider that as a thought, a reason to be. It's going to be an effect. You all are going to agree. We want to have this kind of effect on some sector. For example, we all want to regenerate the soil. We all want to empower children. We all want to effect a sector. And it's up to you all to decide what the form of that is. But that becomes your why. And that's where it all begins. Is that you have this common why. You have this shared vision. All right, let's finish off Senge's video now. So how do you know there actually is a shared vision? It's pretty simple. You watch if people are actually acting in a way that's bringing about something in the whole. There can be plenty of conflict. There can be obviously lots of differences between what people see, how I articulate my vision of an innovative school, how you do. That's all different because we have different points of view. But when it comes to action, there is a coherence to it. We're actually able to work together to bring it about. That's what you're really after in a shared vision. Not everybody's saying the same words. Thank you. Amazing. You can read this paper later. I'm sure you're going to want to be all over it. Um, so just to wrap up, that is the creation process of your why. And if you remember from another video that talked about the why, we must have the why before we can decide the what and the how of our business together. The why is why we exist. Why are we here together? Once we're really solid on that, that we all, through this sharing process, have decided that we want to have this effect on this sector, and we've articulated that as a shared vision or common why, it's then that we can go to the what of our business. And after we decide the what, we can talk about how we're going to do that business, right? But when Senge says that if we really want to know if this is truly happening, we will see the whole inside of each of the people. On this chart, that's kind of like the shared vision here, this beautiful flower coming back down and affecting each one of us. Now, 
influencing and becoming part of each of our personal vision. The whole entire thing, like the whole pattern of the reaction diffusion simulation, or like the whole image, even in that little piece of the hologram, that shared vision is raining down upon us. If one of these petals falls from the flower, it contains the DNA of the whole flower. And each of us get a petal of that so that we have the DNA of the entire whole shared vision inside of our personal vision. And as we talked about before, when we go out there to the real world, each of our personal visions is going to drive us to interact with the natural world. And that's going to be the what and the how of our business. So maybe this person's going to be doing the marketing, and this person's going to be doing some customer business, this person's going to be doing research and development. We're all interacting with the natural world here in different ways, but each of those ways communicates the entirety 